All right, we have been in this series called Comebacks, Greatest Comebacks, and here's what we've talked about so far. Week one, we talked about Samson, and we, we talked about the tragic moment where, you know, he realizes that the, that the presence of God is no longer as close upon him as it had been. And so we talked about four steps to walk away from God. And the one big step it takes, if you want to come back from God, if you're away from God today, is to just turn back to him and he runs to you to forgive and embrace you. And last week we talked about the concept of Moses' story and how failure or the fear of failure can be a big hesitation in coming back or coming back towards the dream or calling that God has placed on your life. Now, we're going to talk today about, about sometimes what happens when we start to move towards something. You know, if you're moving back toward God, or you're moving toward your dream, or you're in some transition and you're coming out of something and into something, sometimes with the comeback moments, we hit this place we'll call the expectation gap. Now, a couple years ago, I preached on this concept, expectation gap. What's that? It's when the reality of your current moment does not live up to the expectations you had about the way things should be. So sometimes we start to move in a particular direction, and, and it's like, I didn't think it'd feel like this. You know, I, I, didn't think it, I don't think it would look like this. I didn't think it would go so slow. <laughs> Maybe you've been there before. I didn't think it'd be this frustrating. I thought, I thought with this step of faith, you know, people would be happy for me. <laughs> you know, so there's all kinds of things that can happen when we move out of something and into something new. Sometimes we run into that expectation gap where we realize it doesn't feel like I thought it would feel. And I, I think this is actually a pretty common emotion right now in this um, last two years. You know, I got to tell you as a pastor, I don't know how many times that they, they said, you know, like the restrictions are lowering. Now everyone's going to come back to church. It's going to be awesome. And then all of a sudden it, it wasn't what, what we thought it would be, right? And then another variant arises or another complication. And so I think for even, I've talked to pastors and people all over the country, really. And, and a lot of people are like, you know, even church as we've come back, doesn't feel like I thought it would feel, or, you know, it feels different. Like, like, what do I do with the expectation gap that sometimes exists in my life? Now, we're going to go into an, another passage that we find in the Jewish scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. And these are three passages that some of you have never read before. And we're going to connect them together, okay? But I promise it's going to be very relevant to your life. And the very first passage we're going to read is found in a book in the Old Testament called Ezra. And we're going to go to Ezra chapter 3. And if you have your Bible and you're searching for that, you can just turn to sort of the middle of the Old Testament and look for, you see, you see some books there, Nehemiah, Ezra, right around there, you'll find those books. Okay, Ezra chapter 3, and here's the context. So to understand a little bit about the history of the nation of Israel, you know, they came into the promised land. When they did, they built this magnificent temple, which was the centerpiece of their worship. Solomon, David's son, was the builder of the temple, and it was glorious. I mean, gold was just, was just dripping off the place. It, it, it was the place where the presence of God rested. It was, it was the centerpiece of their national pride and their experience with God. And over time, both the nations of Israel and Judah walked away from God, and they ended up in a position where they became captive. They, they were defeated by foreign powers. The, the nation of Babylon to the east and north came and destroyed the city of Jerusalem, tore down the walls, desecrated the temple, obliterated it, and carried many of the people of Israel uh, from the, the place of Jerusalem into Babylon. And so... Now, for seven decades, they have lived in captivity. So they've been destroyed. They've been decimated. They're ashamed. They're humiliated. They're thinking to themselves, this will never, we'll never go back there. We'll never go back to our homeland. We'll never worship in that temple again. It's just, it's just a mess, you know? They prayed that God would restore them for seven decades. And, and yet their, their hopes were waning until finally the king gave permission for people from Israel to go back to the city of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. It was beyond their wildest dreams that now they were going to begin to rebuild their homeland and the centerpiece of their, their place of worship, this place of the temple. And here's where we pick it up now in Ezra chapter 3. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests were in their vestments 
And with trumpets, the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals took their place to praise the Lord as prescribed by King David, the, the, the king of Israel. So they sang the old psalms, you know, and they were, they got a band, right? Trumpets and a drummer, cymbals. You know, they got stuff going on out there. They're ready to celebrate this, this grand moment. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, he is good and his love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Everybody say the word foundation. Okay, let me just give you the picture now. The whole temple hadn't been built yet. They had just taken the cornerstone, the first place of the foundation, and they laid the capstone in place. And and then at the beginning of the construction of the temple, they paused to bring out the celebration. They blew the trumpets. They clashed the cymbals. They're singing the psalms. It's a great moment. Seven decades they've waited to be restored to Israel. And now the foundation of the temple is being laid. And then it says this, but many of the older priests and the Levites and the family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. Can can I describe what's happening here? They they saw this temple being rebuilt and they thought to themselves, this isn't at all what it used to be like. I mean, we see the architecture. We see how big this is supposed to be. We look around and we see the walls are still torn down and there are piles of rocks everywhere that still are signs of the fact that this this city was destroyed and burned over and now we just put this little rock in place and they just started to weep. They cried out, oh, you know, we remember Solomon's temple. We remember the gold that, you know, decorated every part. We remember the glory of God here. And now here we are in the middle of what looks like a to be a war zone and we put some little rock in the ground and it just doesn't feel like I thought it would feel after seven decades of praying for this to happen it just doesn't look like I thought it would look and so they cried out because of the expectation gap that existed so the older people who had seen the former temple they they, they grieved while many others shouted for joy. They were like, what are you talking about? This is awesome. Look at this. This is so great. They had no memory of what was. They were only expecting what could be and how God had answered prayer. And it says, no one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping. There was just such a loud cry because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. Can can you feel this now? Can you feel this moment? Sometimes good things are happening but they just don't feel like they used to feel. Sometimes a little step has been taken and and yeah, it's good, but you're like, we need so much more to happen than this. I mean, there's so many problems going on in the world. This little step's great, but could you realize what's at stake here and how big these problems are and how much needs to happen? I mean, we can't rejoice. There's more work to do. This was what they were feeling. This like, there's just no way we can rejoice today because look, we only got one little rock in the ground and this place is a mess. And so they were disheartened, many of them, because it didn't look like they thought it would look and it didn't feel like they thought it would feel. And it was into this era, this general moment, that a prophet spoke. Now we're going to go to a different passage of scripture. If you're in your Bible, go go right, okay? Go towards the book of Matthew, and you're going to find a little prophetic book, just a few chapters, and the prophecies of Haggai are listed there, okay? So this is, I told you, some of you didn't even know there was a prophet Haggai, but now you do. Everybody say the word Haggai. Yeah, okay, here we go. So we're going to hear from Haggai. He steps into this moment, and he says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, he says. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine declares the Lord Almighty. So this answers one of their objections. Like, we remember the old temple. We remember the gold. We remember how glorious. We remember how expensive. 
right? And, and so now, now God says, look, I know there's only a foundation stone, but I own it all. <laughs> I can handle this. Like, trust me. Like, if you're looking for wealth and riches, I, I can shake the nations. I can shake the earth. I have all the resources that you need. He reminds them of this. And then he says this, verse nine. Now, this was the radical prophecy that Haggai states to them. The glory of this present house The one you're building now in the middle of these piles of rubble that doesn't live up to your expectations. The glory of this present house will be greater. Everybody say greater. Will be greater than the glory of the former house. I know you can't see that now because you remember the way that it used to be. But look, this place is gonna have a greater glory from God on it, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant you peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Almighty. Now, I think this particular section of scripture speaks to us today because sometimes the world feels like it's a pile of rubble, doesn't it? It feels like, oh, walls have been torn down and everything's a big mess and it isn't like it used to be. And I didn't think it would look like this. And what do we do now? And that's not just nationally or globally. Sometimes it's personally. We're like, I've come out of something. I'm coming into something, but I just didn't expect it would feel like this. And then you hear the word of the Lord say, what I'm going to do in your future is greater than what I've done in your past. And you're like, how can that be? I have a heart because the past was good. How can it be? Let me just tell you, I'm, I'm going to go on and preach to you, but let me just say for a moment, let me prophesy. Some of you have a struggle believing this, but God is still on the throne and he's able to do in your life even greater things than what you've seen. You cannot afford to let what you feel determine your faith. Look, you've got to lift your faith above your experience, your feelings, your sight. uh, And you've got to say, okay, God, I'm in this now. I believe in you. You, The silver and gold are yours. You're able to do whatever it takes. And so I'm believing that the future is bright because you have promised this to me. Now, let me just give you a couple couple of thoughts here. First thing, if you're going to go that way with God, first, you've got to say this. I'll not measure what God's doing in my life by how it looks and feels. You know, a lot of us, we have sunk down to live into how it looks and feels. We let our faith be determined by how we feel about what's happening or how others feel or how others are reflecting to us or how it appears on the surface or how our minds can conceive how this could potentially work out. And we can't put our faith on how it looks or feels, but on who God is and what he has promised. Now, now this is the journey of a mature person who's following Christ. And that is that you attach yourself to what God has said and who he is more than anything else. And this requires radical faith because sometimes you're like, I I feel almost like (laughs) I'm in denial (laughs) because look at how messed up this is. But I believe that God is doing something in my future. And let me remind you that when Haggai prophesied, he said this, he said, once more, I will shake the heavens and the earth. And then he says, and once more, I will shake the nations. Now, what's that about? Is God threatening us? No, here's what he was indicating. Before he said the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of what was, he says this, I have the ability to shake even the heavens. Now, now, the heavens are probably the most stable entity that we depend on every day. I don't know about you, but I don't typically go to bed at night wondering, boy, I hope the sun is stable. I hope that the planets continue to orbit around the sun properly. I hope that the earth continues to turn on its axis so we get a 24-hour day. I hope we don't move too close to the sun and burn up or move too far away. And uh, no, we we get up, we we look at the sky, and all we're worried about is it raining or not, right? I mean, we're not worried about whether the universe is going to implode into one big black hole or explode. I mean, we count on the fact that the heavens are stable. And, and the Almighty says, I'm greater than the heavens. You think the heavens are stable. I can shake them with just a word because God said, let there be light and light began to extend. You see, he created with the word and he sustains it by his power. And so we got to remember, he is far greater than even the most stable aspects of our world. Aren't you thankful for that today? Yeah. And he said, I'm going to shake the nations. So the nations, the most powerful nations on earth, the the ones that, that, 
that can be oppressive and difficult. God says, I'm greater than any world power. And any king or president or emperor or dictator who rules, I am greater than that. And so you may feel threatened by what's going on in the nations of the world. But let me just tell you, I can shake the nations with or Aren't you glad that God is greater than the president of the United States? No matter which party he is from, <laughs> right? Come on, that God's so much greater. In fact, last week, the message that Melody shared here at Hampton, I know what she talked about this idea of God speaking to Moses from the burning bush and saying his name, I am that I am. And part of that is not just I was and I will be, but I'm present in your life, but also God is the I am, meaning that he is the self-sufficient sovereign God that doesn't depend on anything. Do you know, there's never a day in God's world where he's like, I'm tired, I need to rest for a minute. God doesn't lean on anything. He doesn't stand on anything. He is outside of time and space and matter, and he is completely self-sufficient. So when that God says, your future will be brighter than your past, and you say, but, but Lord, look, he's like, I can shake the heavens. <laughs> I can shake the nations. I have all the money in the world, and I am not dependent on anything. So we trust him, and we trust in what he has promised us. Then there's, another, there's, a third, there's a third book. I told you we were going to talk about three passages, all speaking to the same era. Um, this is another, maybe a prophet you never read before. His name is Zechariah. He speaks into the same exact moment now. And here's what Zechariah says in chapter 4. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Okay, who in the world is Zerubbabel? We got Zechariah and Zerubbabel. You may be confused. Zerubbabel was the name of the leader of the government in Israel at this time. And some of you are like, that's a cool name. Everybody say, the, say, the, say it with me, Zerubbabel. Some of you just found the name for your son. When, you'll be the only Zerubbabel in his class. Trust me. Come on. You'll call him Big Z. There you go. You got a name. Yeah. And, and then his brother Haggai. You got, you got all this going on. Here, here we go. So, and here, here he says, say this to the leader of Israel, not by might. You know this first. You didn't know where it's found, maybe. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. How is this going to happen? Not by might, not by human wisdom, but by power and by the spirit of God, says the Lord Almighty. And then, and then he says, what are you, mighty mountain? You got a big obstacle in your way? What is a mountain to the Lord? What is this obstacle? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. God's going to get his heavenly earth mover and just plow that mountain down in front of you. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of God bless it. God bless it. We're going to come back to this verse. Just remember that little phrase. Verse 8, then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares, this is the part I really want to focus on here, despise the day of small things. An another translation says, who do dares despise the day of small beginnings? Since the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone. Remember, that was that foundation that had been laid in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now, here's the second choice we have to make, and that's this. I will not despise the day of small beginnings because a little in God's hands is more than enough. Sometimes we measure, we're like, yeah, but there's only a little tiny thing there, God. I mean, I'm praying for a family revival, and, and, and this was just one positive conversation, you know. How, how can that mean something? I mean, God, God, I'm trying to pay off all these credit cards, and okay, I got one of them paid off, but there's 18 more, right? Like, God, God I'm, I, I'm trying to take this step of faith towards this dream, and, and yeah, this was a, a good turn, but you know how far we have to go, right? There's so many ways we could apply this, but God says, look, don't, don't overlook, don't turn your head up, don't, don't look at contempt, like, what's that? I mean, come on, it's just a capstone. Don't you see how messed up this city is? God says, look, don't despise the beginnings of what I'm going to do, or you might miss the full work that I'm trying to accomplish in your life. Do you know, you know sometimes, sometimes God just drops a good miracle right in your lap. 
bam, and it's complete. I love those ones, don't you? Immediate, complete, overpowering. And you know, sometimes God does things in phases. A lot of what God describes that he does in our lives comes from the concepts of agriculture. It's like, I remember in fifth grade, some of you might've had this project too. You know, they started to teach us about how plants grow. And so they gave us a little plastic cup with some soil that we put in it. And it gave us a seed. Do you remember this project? Did you have this project? And you, and you put the seed in, you watered it, and then you carried it home carefully. And you walked in the house and you said, mom, I got a plant here. I'm supposed to put it on the window seal where the sun is. And so you go over and put this holy plant on the, on the window seal. And then you come back an hour later and you're like, did I do it wrong? It's not growing yet. No, and mom says, no, 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 listen, listen. It takes a while. So maybe tomorrow morning, oh, you wake up, you can't wait. You go to the window seal. Ah, is it there? Is it there? No, nothing. Ah, wow, did it die? I'm just going to dump this dirt out. No, mom says, no, 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 hold on. And then maybe the next day, you start to see a tiny little sprout pop out of the soil. And you're like pumped. Like, yeah, my plant is beginning to grow. You see, see, this is often how God works. There is a there is a sprout that pops up that doesn't look like much at the beginning. But if you'll just let it grow, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. That is the tiniest seed that you can ever plant. But it grows to be the, the biggest massive tree in the garden. Mustard seed, I was going to bring it with me today, I didn't. But if, if you have a crumb on the table when you're eating later today and you go like that to pick up the crumb, that's like mustard seed size. Okay, so some things, God starts in seed form. And if you treat with contempt the beginnings, you might miss the big massive work that God's getting ready to do in your life. Here's the third choice that we have to make, and that's this. I will not wait for everything to be completed to begin to speak in agreement with what God has promised. You know, sometimes we're already, yeah, we're already defeated inside because of the expectations we have. And then and all we see is a little, little sprout in the soil, a little a rock in the ground that's the cornerstone, and we're tempted to quit. But here's what they did. Remember, it says, I told you we'd come back to this verse. Um, then he will bring out the capstone to the shouts, God bless it. <laughs> You see, they were speaking in faith. They were saying, God, bless this foundation. Make it a temple. We're going to work with you to build this place. And we're going to believe in that, that you're going to bring reformation back to our city. And that there's going to be a national revival that we're going to experience. It's only a tiny little rock in the ground right now. But we say, okay, come on. Bless you, Cornerstone. God's got more in store. And so we start to allow, line our lips, our tongue with the word of God. And when we do, we partner with heaven to bring his resources down to earth. And let me just say, you're gonna say something. Why not say something that strengthens your faith? If you say, ah, yeah, well, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, maybe when there is a little bit more progress, then call me then, you know? No, no, people of faith start to speak what God has promised ahead of any visible progress. See, this is part of how we stay centered is we attach ourselves to the word of God. And I don't know what you're feeling is just a tiny little small beginning in a dream that you've been coming back towards or a promise that you've been believing for or a prayer that seems like it's long overdue. But can you just, can you just for a moment say, God, I believe in you. <laughs> I believe in what you've said. And even the small beginnings, I'm not going to show contempt for them, but I'm going to speak in faith, believing that this little start is going to be a massive work in my life. Here's the main idea of the message today. What God is going to do in your future, in our future, is far greater than what I can ask or imagine. But I may miss it if I measure my life by immediate or outward expectations. So some of you may be wondering, so what happened to that temple that they built? Did it ever get built? Yes, it did. Was it ever as glorious as Solomon's temple? No. Didn't have as much gold. It was never quite as, as expensive or ornamental. Yeah, 
Herod came along later and expanded it, but it wasn't quite ever what Solomon built. You say, well, then that promise didn't come to pass. Well, I mean, he said the glory of the temple they were building would be greater than the glory of the one that Solomon had built. So what? Are we supposed to expect? We, should we lower our standards? Should we expect a little bit less? God's going to do something, but you know, no, listen, when God does something, he does something new. And, and it was not that it was going to be exactly like Solomon's temple. There was actually a paradigm shift coming. What made the glory of the temple they were building greater than Solomon's temple was that Jesus visited that temple. Listen, there are many verses just like this one, where each day Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, was teaching at the temple. So, so God, the Redeemer, Jesus, the Savior, came and he walked on those temple grounds and he walked around where that capstone was and he began the process of redemption for us and for billions of others who would find salvation in his name. And it started not because it was as ornamental as the past, but because God purposed it for something new. Let me just tell you, if you're gonna measure your life based on something, you wanna measure it not based on how it looks or feels or the expensive nature of how it might look in the eyes of people, but you want to measure it based upon the fact that Jesus Christ himself is alive today. He is still working in the world, and he is the one who wants to visit us in the future. So wherever Jesus is, is better. And I, I just want to tell you, he doesn't live in the past. The resurrected Jesus sits on the throne, and he's moving in the future. And if we're always turned around looking, wow, wasn't that awesome back then? We're going to miss what he's doing right now. Because you see, Jesus wants to visit your life and your family and your future. In Jesus' name, let's pray together. Wherever you are, whatever location, if you're, if you're joining us on the broadcast, Father, give us a fresh perspective of our situations. Help us look at the world different through the eyes of faith. Help us to look at our struggles differently, even the small signs of progress. God, re remind us that you're a God who answers prayer and that you don't forget us and you're not gonna leave us or forsake us. And that, that you're saying to us today that the, the future will be greater because you're gonna visit us as we take steps of faith. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. amen.